Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next segment of Ask the Zamboni Experts podcast. I'm uh, Marty Elliott, sales as a account manager out of uh, Zamboni, Canada. And my uh, other host is uh, Doug Peters, our regional manager of the United States. Two great guests, and you're going to enjoy this podcast today. We have David Santee, who's our silver uh, uh, skating uh, medalist uh, and figure skating uh, USA national medalist, and also Scott Moyer, our two-time Olympic uh, gold medalist. Uh, welcome, gentlemen, to uh, today's podcast. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, pleasure, pleasure. Uh, thanks for joining us, guys. So let's get it going. David, got to ask you a question. Have you, and when was it, your first time to drive a Zamboni? I was uh, I was able in the late 90s, around 1998, to manage a rink in Niles, Illinois. And so, of course, if you manage a rink, you better learn how to drive the Zamboni. So it was probably around 1998 that I drove the Zamboni for the first time. And, you know, it, it was so much fun. I actually had, I was playing adult hockey at the time and one of my teammates said you've got to have a zamboni fantasy camp so we actually looked into it but um our risk management agency here in illinois didn't really like it that much back in the day uh, too bad because i think it would have been a lot of fun fantastic how about you scotty uh, i'm laughing at that i'm i think i'm realizing uh it's a bit embarrassing like i've grown up in the arena hockey and figure skating and I have driven the Zamboni, but I've never resurfaced the ice. Like it's never been actually working. I've just driven it on the ice. And um, I, yeah, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that. I guess I better get to the rink tonight and fix that. You better talk to Will. You got to get to Will to get you on the machine to do some uh, I know, ice. I, I get, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd like to, I don't know if they'd let me do that at the Scotiabank Arena or, what, or whatever it's called now, ACC, or I'd love to do that, but. Well, I got to tell you, that's a great setup for my next question. You guys are both aware of David Ayers, the uh, backup uh, uh, Zamboni uh, driver <laughs> or backup goalie uh, Zamboni driver for uh, for their uh, their practice facility for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Here's my question: Has a Zamboni driver, backup driver, ever come into the skating performance in your worlds and actually had to figure skate that you're aware of? No, but since <laughs> I now know that Scott has driven a Zamboni, he's our guy. <laughs> I, you think so? I think uh, the good days are behind me, possibly for performing. But uh, I'm a Leafs fan, so that that really hurt. I, we didn't. Even, I don't think we even picked up a point that night. So let's not uh, bring that up too much more. What team won that game? Oh, yeah, not the Leafs. The Carolina Hurricanes. Carolina, yeah. A, and they got beat by what? A backup yeah. goalie that was a Zamboni driver? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, I th I'm Whoa. pretty sure he had beer in his water bottle when he was playing out there. <laughs> I thought he little, got called in from one of the suites. The first couple of shots looked like he might have been having a couple of beers for the first period. Hey, Doug, you got to be careful because David Ayers, I put out an email to him to uh, join us as a guest on a future podcast. So you might want to be careful what you say. <laughs> hey, I'm all for it. You know, that's that's awesome. Anybody who can drive our machines and stop pucks from a professional team and win the game, be the number one star, and then go on to all the – the accolades that he did, that's awesome. It is. When is the fantasy hard. camp? I want to know. I'm going to sign up for that. <laughs> hey, they started on Monday, Scott. They started on Monday. That's when they started. So here's a question for you both. Scott, if you weren't figure skating, if you never got into it, what sport would you have been playing? Good question. Uh, you know, it's kind of typical for me, and I think people get bored of my answers because they haven't changed much. I'm still the same guy, but... I always thought like the reason why I wanted to go uh, to, to the arena and, and be there is I wanted to be Joe Sackick my entire life. Like I thought that uh, I my big goal as a young boy was to win the Stanley Cup. And uh, it didn't it took a while actually for me to realize, uh, you know, after Tessa came into my life that, hey, I'm I don't know where uh, how quickly it took a 90 degree turn. But uh, all of a sudden I didn't want to be Joe Sackick. I wanted to be an ice dancer. Um, and I guess there's not that much of a difference between the two after all. Uh, wow. But uh, I thought I'd be a hockey player for sure. And, and I thought I'd uh, play for the, yeah, play for the Leafs. And still for me, when I do shows or, or compete in an NHL rink, like uh, I still like the first thing I have to do is, is kind of go over to, to the pro, pro locker room, see them, you know, get used to being in their rank and then be like, okay, I got a job to do. Cause I'm still going to watch an NHL game. I still feel like I'm eight or nine years old. No doubt. Yeah. No doubt. It, it's, it's, 
Yeah. Sorry, my sorry, story ahead, is very similar. But the first thing I got to say, like, I'm with you. I, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be an international official. So, I, you know, I've been on Scott's panels, you know, a few times. But I go, especially <laughs> if I get a... That. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm usually the data guy in your event, so I, I don't. I only put down what they they tell me. But usually, if I ever get assigned to anything in North America, the first thing I do is I look for souvenirs from that team. So, you know, we've been lucky. We've been, you know, all different places. So I, it's not even just pro. You know, pro. I get you know Canadian Major Junior and stuff like that. So I've gotten some really good hats and jerseys and stuff like that from very first day I get in, I start looking for the souvenir store. And I, it's been interesting because um, one year it was out in, I believe it was Halifax. It was way out, way east. And um, I got there the first day and it actually took me into the general manager's office. And the general manager himself went and got the keys to the souvenir store and, and, uh, uh, he took me down there and sold me a jersey and a hat. I was like, that's pretty, that's pretty awesome. You don't get that in an NHL building. So, no. but to answer the main question for me, I had two, two goals and loves in my younger life. Number one was, was hockey. So I guess that's why I ended up being a figure skater. I absolutely loved Bobby Hull. And, um, what stopped me from following that path? Cause I did play as a mite and uh, I saw a picture of Bobby Hull on the back of the Chicago Sun Times after a fight with John Ferguson. So you can imagine what he looked like, you know, no teeth and blood all over the place. And I'm like, I think I'm going to be a figure skater. So that was the end of that. And then the other dream of mine is my other, my other passion besides being a huge hockey fan is being a huge Chicago Cubs fan. So I always dreamed of being a shortstop for the Cubs. So neither one happened. So. Hey, never say never. Never say never. Uh, my it. range is not what it used to be, especially with an artificial hip. I'm not sure that the diving would be very good, but. Uh, there you go. There you go. I, I could probably take a punch, though. <laughs> I uh, I can say that, well, I've been to Wrigley a couple of times. Me and my buddies always do a, a ball trip every year and take a go to as many parks as we can. And, oh, my gosh, every time I've been to Wrigley, it's special, man. That's the same type of a thing, but. Uh, my quick baseball story is uh, two summers ago I was playing and it was like our first game uh, was slow pitch so you pretty much wait for the ball to come in right and then hit it and I was playing outfield and me and the boys got in a couple beers before and I missed the ball and it smoked me off the head <laughs> and then we had to do an appearance like a week later and I could only open one eye it was, so I had to let baseball sit for a season but I'm back this year hopefully that oh boy so what hurt more are you falling on your right hip during a dance uh, competition or getting hit off the noodle? <laughs> <laughs> My pride hurt a lot more uh, at baseball, that's for sure. My buddies thought it was pretty hilarious. but Fantastic. So you guys both nationally, internationally, your travel that you've experienced over your, over your uh, professional careers, let me uh, ask you both, uh, what's the favorite, uh, favorite memory you guys have had as far as uh, traveling to a skating competition? Uh, could be exotic, uh, remote, uh, and perhaps share a fun story of something that's taken place. Could be in a hotel, could be at the arena, could be with locals. Uh, maybe you can uh, share an experience. Well, mine is easy. My, the highlight of my traveling experience was 1980 in Lake Placid. Um, not only because I was able to compete there and I was in the fight, I ended up fourth. I was third going into the long program. So I was in the fight for a medal. You know, I was at my home country, but I was at every hockey game except for I had a practice when they played Czechoslovakia, which was the second game. I missed that. So I was at every game. So this is a little known story that I can now say because it's been 40 years. So we, there was a, we hatched upon this scheme, we, meaning a few of the figure skaters, you would get one ticket to an indoor event every day. Now we could use our passes to go to the ski jumping and all that stuff, but one pass. So hockey obviously was most of us, that was our goal, especially when we kind of were feeling the, the bigger buzz with each game. So we found that if we went and took our ticket and went outside and sold it, there was always a row of seats right behind the goal where Ruzioni scored the winning goal. And, and it was never used because ABC's announce table was right there and they didn't want anybody right behind that announce table. So it was always wide open. So we went and sat there for every game and we went and sold our tickets. So it was great. 
So, I mean, I was right there. I was right there. And then uh, many years later, my son, Mike, who's uh, who's, who's, uh, played in Pembroke uh, as a junior, he had a hockey tournament in Lake Placid. And so they had one game in in the Herb Brooks Arena. And so I said to the other fathers, I am going to go sit by myself. I'm going to go sit exactly in the, the seat that I sat in in 1980. And I'm going to watch it. I, I couldn't have anybody by me because it just I was so emotional. See my son out there where I competed and where I sat to watch. It was almost too much. Like if good thing that like the music Rocky was playing, that would have been the end of me. I would have been a puddle of water for sure. <laughs> I love so, that's a great story. <laughs> so David, if I can jump in here, Marty, were you yeah. at the in those seats during at the Russian game? behind the goal that Ruzioni scored? <laughs> I could have probably thrown, I had a, another story. I had a tin of chocolate chip cookies, which were sent to me by a fan. And we had those, Scott Hamilton and myself and a couple other guys. We had those, we were eating those. So I could have really, literally frisbeed the chocolate chip cookie and hit Ruzioni's puck as it was going into the net if I wanted. That's how close I was. So I'm going to have to look at my pictures that I've got hanging on the wall for the greatest event ever in my lifetime. <laughs> And I was I, right there. I, 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 let's, only just, can, let's Canadians stop you there for yeah, one second. Yeah. What? You scared. Win one Olympics and it's a miracle, of course. Like, like, I, I got to live in my past there. a little bit. I got to live in the past a little bit. And I've only brought that. If you talk to Mike Zamboni, I've only discussed this, I don't know, 10 or 15,000 times. And every discussion we have always devolves back to the 1980 Olympics. It's I so just want to say, actually. too, before we take too much of a beating over 1980, I do believe there was some chicanery that went on in Salt Lake City with some, like, loony or toony or wow. something that ended up, wow. you know, under the ice at center. <laughs> so I would say, you know, hey, let us have our one moment of glory because you guys we, certainly, uh, that that we, charm worked pretty well for you that year. We Yeah, we needed it, I guess. But it was, it was kind of funny because one of my biggest rivals was Charlie White um, when I was when I was skating and we trained together, but we also had a really good friendship. And, you know, kind of between 2010 and 2014, like we were such intense rivals that our friendship changed a little bit. But we'd always talk about going into Vancouver. Uh, you know, I'd always say like that line, like, oh, yeah, it must be a miracle if America's winning hockey at the Olympics and blah, blah, blah. And he'd fire back as like, I don't know if many, many of you know, Charlie White, he's quite a good hockey player. Uh, yeah, he, triple A. Yeah, he AAA, played. Yeah. Those, I think he played what he played one of those victories, Honda, no, Honey Baked or whatever. It's one of those Michigan teams anyways. Um, so we were always going back and forth and we were both at that uh, the gold medal game in, in 2010. And it's the same thing. Like Tess and I thought like winning the Olympics was great, but the best perk was that we got to watch every single game of that run. And I'll never forget how anxious and nervous I was after America tied it up at the end of the game in, in Vancouver. And I was just like, I'm never going to hear the end of this from Charlie if, uh, if they pull it off the comeback. But luckily, Canada... Came yeah, back and won. I think we all remember I, what happened in 2014 I, too. And I was just going to say, wasn't that, wasn't that wasn't that a fella from Cole Harbor there, Scotty? That uh, popped yeah, that bill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I remember that well, guy. I remember yeah, that guy. Yeah, was, yeah, was considering cool. the ice was slanted because it was in Canada, and the fact that a Minnesota boy scored the tying goal late in the game, and had the U.S. won that, I think all of can look what happened when Vancouver lost the Stanley Cup. Could you imagine what would have happened in Vancouver had they lost the gold medal on their soil with the greatest hockey players in the world against this upstart little country called the United States of America? Oh, my God. Here's, here's, be- here's the best backup, Doug. We did win the gold medal, and you're talking to one of them. The one right now, baby. On no, home no, ice. A lot number of people two's don't okay. Know. No, but, you know, a lot of people don't know that first Canadian dance pair, first Canadian Olympians ever to win a gold winner medal on their own soil. A lot of people don't know that. Stammy, correct there, uh, Scotty? Is that no, correct? No, I think that's right, yeah. Are you talking about Tessa Virtue again? Yeah, I just have to stand <laughs> beside her through all those times, but I can't remember her stats, but they're pretty impressive. They are I, very what impressive. What I think about when I think talk about the Olympics in 1980, I, I was, uh, I don't quite remember that one. No, no you fellas but uh i will say that i i still look back at 2018 and i had a lot of friendships with the teams like the of the non-pros that went or the pros that were playing in switzerland or whatever but i mean i think we missed probably the like 
best hockey tournament we would have ever seen. The American team would have been so strong. Canada would have been amazing. Yes. It would have been so awesome to see. I'm a little bit sour about that still, but that's okay. We didn't win that one either. That's probably why I'm sour. The door's <laughs> still open for Beijing 2022. They haven't made a decision yet, so you never know. See what happens. So, Scotty, what, uh, what's the your biggest experience? Yeah, well, I'll be there. Trust me, it's to Tooney this, <laughs> this time, not a loony. What's your biggest experience in traveling, uh, Scotty? Uh, good question. It's hard. It's hard to replace, uh, you know, being being at a home Olympics. Uh, but I, I will say that uh, being in Pyeongchang and and just kind of the for us, it was kind of the pinnacle of our career. Uh, so competitively, we felt like we were really on top of our game, and uh, that was the whole reason why we came back to compete. So selfishly. Um, you know, that, that was, that was probably the highlight of her athletic life, but in some ways, Sochi was a, is a sweeter memory. Um, uh, we weren't as ready. Uh, we got there, we got our ass kicked by the Americans, um, and, and probably deserve a week. So, uh, Charlie and Merrill were really on and kind of dominated us going into those Olympics. So, uh, but when we, after those games, Patrick Chan and Tess and I, another friend of ours, uh, who's a loser, Sam Medney, we thought that we were Canada's good luck charms. So. Yeah. In Russia, the setup, while it might have cost $52 billion, uh, the setup was pretty sweet for athletes because all the venues were right there. So we were just kind of right. running around to to each venue. And, um, I mean, in a day, you'd knock out, like, a curling match and a women's hockey and then the next day a men's hockey and a, a men's curling match, which all which Canada won uh, in Sochi. So we kind of felt like we were those – uh, we are the good luck charms. So I would say that that was, that was a highlight of all the years, kind of being able to run to the Molson Canadian house, grab a couple of those, yes. and then off to the venue and en enjoy every single uh, sporting event that was in that little Olympic park. It was pretty neat. On the way home, yeah. uh, thinking that it's $53 billion to make an Olympic Games happen, I maybe feel a little guilty, but right in that time, it was pretty awesome. I have to say, I was there as an official, so it was awesome. Like, we would get to all the other events like Scott said during the day and then you know I didn't have to have a lot of prep time like the athletes did we just had to show up we had our pre-meeting and off we went so uh, it was it was an amazing experience too and it took me three days to realize that being a, an Olympic alum that I could get into USA house for free so after that then boy the, yeah we were there all the time I heard USA house at that game those games were pretty amazing like it was they always do a pretty good job I wasn't necessarily allowed in there that much well, I have one. Yeah, I bet. I have one a story about USA House. So I was in there at lunch one day and I'm standing in the line to get something to eat. And all of a sudden I look next to me and it's Ryan Kessler. And again, you guys already talked about Vancouver. And yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of ironic because yesterday they had a, a reunion of the 2010 Hawks. And so there were 16 of the guys that were on this Zoom call and and they were all saying, yeah, you know, Vancouver, you know, it was such an intense. It was chippy. It was dirty. It was this and was that. So I turned to Ryan Kessler and I said, you know, I just want to tell you, like, I really I love the way you play, but I got to tell you, I hate the Canucks. And he laughed and I didn't realize that he wanted to get traded. He was he got traded to Anaheim not that far long after that. So it's like, well, that's why he laughed, because it's like, well, yeah, I kind of hate the Canucks right now, too. <laughs> Let's uh, I think uh, uh, Dave Doug, Doug has some uh, some direct personal questions. Yeah, you, I bet David. he does. So, <laughs> oh, he does, and I've seen him. So I, 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 and Scott, we're gonna sit back and listen to the banter here for a bit. And Can I Scott, have Scott be my mouthpiece so that uh, you know again you don't get to chance. hit that dump button? No, not a chance. I'm on and my Scott, own, huh? You're on oh, your own, gonna, Scotty. I'm see how this plays out. I don't know. Corey Perry is an Anaheim boy for a long time. He's from London, so I gotta support yeah. him. Amen yeah. to that. Doug, he, go he, ahead. he was a, a great player for the Ducks. Enjoyed him for many years, and uh, sad to see one of the twins go. Uh, it's just disappointing that they couldn't get over the hump when they had Bruce. I can get a hundred uh, point season as a coach, Boudreau, but I can't lead you past the game seven. Uh, in any playoff series, but I, I won't digress into that. So, um, David, you touched on the greatest event in my lifetime. I'm blessed to have met several of the players from the 1980 Olympic team. My claim to fame as a uh, hockey player is nowhere near Marty's level or uh, yours or Scott's. Um, I got to skate against Mike Ramsey uh, as a sophomore in high school. He graduated with my sister 
uh, from the great powerhouse Minneapolis Roosevelt, who produced two of the best defensemen in U.S. hockey history in Reed Larson and uh, Mike Ramsey. Um, but I'm just wondering if uh, you could um, fill us in, knowing also that you are somewhat of a collector of memorabilia, as you talked about. What items did you obtain from the 80 games and what's most special to you? Well, I wish I could move a little bit because I've got some, I, I got a bunch of signed uh, prints of the different sports. So I got almost every member of the hockey team, U.S. hockey team, the, the, almost all the U.S. speed skating team, including Eric Hyden and the figure skating team. And uh, I've got, well, I've got all sorts of stuff. Now I have to say, like, as far as our uniforms and stuff, you know, a lot of that you end up trading, you know, because you can end up with, with some other country stuff and it's usually pretty good. Well, I didn't trade a lot because it was Levi's that year and they did a really nice job. And I actually have one of my warm-up jackets is downstairs framed. The other one is going to get framed from 76. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have always been a sous vide guy. Everybody knows that, you know. So I'm always on the prowl for any of that kind of stuff, even way back in 1980. So, yeah, it's a, it's a hobby. Great, great. Uh, Scott, it's interesting to me that uh, your partner is named – her name is Tessa. I have a stepdaughter named Tessa, and that's not a very um, – it's not a common name, so that, that's kind of cool. Maybe you can, and I'm jumping on Marty here's toes a little bit, but um, maybe you can fill us in a little bit as to uh, how you two got together. Yeah, for sure. Uh, wow. It's, uh, Tessa and I, I guess we skated together for 22 years. So we started skating in uh, 1997 together, and uh, we were from the same skating club, very, uh, very close together uh, geographically. And uh, she came into the club and she was an all-star right away. I kind of can remember her walking in and being two years younger than me and um, and a girl. And as I was an, an eight-year-old boy, her being better than me and way better than me really pissed me off. And that was really my motivation for the first two or three years of us skating together was that she was on a daily basis showing me up. And eventually, I kind of understood that, oh, like, this girl is on my team. That's pretty sweet. So once I got past that, that we started working together more so, but uh, really that was the motivation in the beginning. And um, now we're at a point in our career uh, where we've, we've retired from skating, we've retired from show skating, uh, and we're looking back. And I don't know if it's the, maybe the first time we've really looked back, at, you know, with, with a clearer vision and, and better perspective, but I mean, what a ride we had together. And um, we we're very, very fortunate. We... We were very driven together. Uh, we we always were. Probably people thought we were a little crazy, but even as youngsters, like we wanted to win and we wanted to win everything. We were very competitive, and uh, our timing was always one of our strengths because we, our goals were always in line with each other. And when we wanted to skate and we wanted to go for it, um, so did she. And then when we wanted to, you know, hang them up, we were both in agreement, and we always understood that we did that together. But you know, Tessa. I can't say like it's kind of funny. It's almost I get emotional thinking about um, holy like the things she had to deal with with me over the years. But uh, she's a very special person, and uh, I, I always say now never bet against Tessa Virtue, and I can't wait to see where she goes. I mean, Ice Dance for her is kind of just a jumping off point. She's just uh, just brilliant, and so now I'm doing a little bit of coaching and trying to get uh, you know inspire some kids to have sport experiences like us and and i need to try and get tessa back in into the ring because the way she can create and, and how brilliant she is is i've never seen before and i've worked with some of the best um in figure skating for, so i think anyways and so tessa and i yeah we've had a we've had a really great run and and really uh interesting uh you know through adolescence and everyone thought well, we had the secret relationship going on and we did love each other but it wasn't romantic and one funny bit, you said your your daughter, uh, uh, stepdaughter's name's Tessa, but I know two Tessas. And, and one, my brother started dating and is now his wife. So with all the <laughs> dating rumors and stuff, my sister-in-law's name is Tessa Moyer. So she goes into work and during the Olympics in 2018, when we kind of went through the height of her, I guess, popularity and, you know, all social media and all that crap that everybody does. And uh, she'd go into work with clients that she's worked with for years and they'd be like, Tessa Moyer? 
are you a skater? And she's like, oh my God. So <laughs> those are the two tests I grew up knowing. And now we've seen a lot more kind of coming through that people watch the 2010 Olympics and start naming their kids after Tessa, and, which is good. She's a good role model. So. Amen well, that. before I, I, I toss it back to Marty, I'm going to throw out one bit of trivia for us. In 2010, uh, Tong and Pang uh, were competitive skaters from China. And yeah. uh, he purchased uh, a machine for his ice rink uh, from us. And I've had the pleasure of uh, meeting with him in Beijing a couple of times. And uh, just an awesome, awesome guy. I have not met his wife yet. Uh, but uh, what a great experience. I've been very blessed in my career, uh, being the dinosaur that I am, uh, to have met many, many people. And this is very enjoyable to, to meet you for the first time today. Oh, nice to meet you as well. Like he's a, he is a good dude, and he, he's running his own rank still, right? It's yeah, yeah. He's yeah. got a couple over there, and uh, hopes to develop more training programs. And uh, we actually got to hand the keys over to him from a machine built in Canada, uh, a 650 that uh, went over to uh, to Beijing, and we had it at a show, and it was uh, it was great, great experience. Uh, he was like the Beatles, as far as I'm concerned, when he was walking through the throngs of media and everything that were following him in the exhibition hall uh, was amazing. And, and I think Meryl Davis and her partner were over there. I've got some pictures uh, yeah, in, in my, in my phone somewhere. Yeah. 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 yeah, they had a pretty, like, I mean, I think they got uh, engaged on the ice even, Pang and Tong, that is. Like, I think, too bad yeah. you weren't at that ceremony, but there was some <laughs> sort of a... <laughs> Probably there was a Zamboni in the back of that one. <laughs> hey, Scotty, here's here's something, a uh, little uh, trivia for you. If you're ever out in Vancouver, and I think you probably uh, can uh, have a couple beers with uh, Michael Boulay, he does have a Zamboni in his house. No, so he does. Need, wow. He, he does. If you want to drive a Zamboni, just have beers back at his house. He'll take you downstairs in the elevator and have at it. You can drive a Zamboni all day long and drink beer. Nobody I'm impressed he has an elevator, much less a Zamboni. I was just going to say, it's good to know another guy who has an elevator in his house. It's a real pain in the ass to get him serviced. Mine is just always, you know, it's tough to get figured out and going. And I only have one floor, but I got an elevator. I was going to say, I, I know guys with an elevator, but they live in apartments. <laughs> oh, this is getting good. This is getting good. Hey, David, got to qu ask a question. Family members, any other family members skating your, uh, uh, are skaters in your family? The Santee family is uh, has been in skating for a long time. My parents, neither one was a skater. My dad played basketball in high school. He was all state in Illinois, and then he went to Purdue, and he, he was a little short to be uh, a forward in, in uh, college. So that was the end of him, and my mom was a physical education major. And uh, at an early age, they encouraged us to find something that, you know, obviously kept us active and that uh, we were good at and there happened to be a rink about six blocks away from my house that was offering a special on skates and lessons and so my mom signed me up and the rest is history well there you go scotty i do know the family a little bit and i think uh, you can share a little bit about uh, mom and brothers and uh, uh, cousins so uh, share with the uh, audience uh, oh gosh that are skating where do I begin here? It's so funny, actually, David, to, to hear you tell your story because there's a lot of similarities, and uh, it's it's kind of weird how two different worlds, well, not different worlds, but uh, across the continent and still so similar. But I came from a skating family as well. Um, my mom and my aunt were identical twins. Uh, well, they still are identical twins. <laughs> uh, but they, yeah, when they were skating, they used to do carnivals all over the place because they were, as I said, identical twins. But like you can't tell the difference between the two of them. So they would do, um, and my mom would say, we'd get all these skating carnivals because we were a freak show, but we didn't even care. We just loved to skate. And um, they kind of moved into a 40 plus year coaching uh, career. And they still coach today. Actually, the, the coaching staff that I'm on now includes both my mom and my aunt and a couple of my cousins who were synchro world champions uh, in 2008 with the Nexus team representing Canada. And Barely squeaked by a couple of really good American teams there. And then, uh, but the reason I started figure skating was because of my brother and cousin. They, they were a part of an ice dance team that uh, got to do some junior Grand Prix and got to travel around the world. And I'd say that that kind of is what interested Tessa and I, to be able to travel and 
and kind of see these different cultures, you know, go to Europe a couple of times. And that's what really got us hooked. Uh, and then obviously the goal of the Olympic Games took over from there. But it was it really was inspired by uh, my cousin Sherry and, and my brother Dan. And uh, it's kind of interesting how that kind of sticks with you. And uh, he, they've gone on to live. They have families. And my brother has um, uh, is a firefighter in Calgary. I'm very proud of him. And I, I just kind of stuck with it, I guess. And, and here I am still ice dancing at 32 years old. <laughs> and I Pretty forgot, I mean, I forgot my, my brother is the executive director of the PSA, Professional Skaters Association. He competed oh, at nationals. That's a good guy to know. My nephews and nieces are all in Disney on Ice, three of them, two girls and one boy. My son, Mike, who I mentioned, played, he figure skated for a while and then decided he liked hockey better and played hockey, ended up at West Point. So he's now a... He graduated West Point, uh, has, has just left the Army as a captain, and has gone into private life. So, yeah, I mean, skating wow. is everywhere in our family. My mom and dad actually going past that. My dad at 88 still opens the buildings on Saturday mornings and drives the Zamboni. 88. That is oh, so boy. cool. Is that, at West, is that at West Point? Uh, no, I, I live in Park Ridge, yeah. Illinois. So my dad, oh, okay. he, in my hometown rank, he's there. Um, yeah, my, Mike was at West Point, my son, but um, right. and uh, outside of us going to visit him a lot, uh, mm -hmm. you know, none of us have any connection there. No, what was well, that I, emotion I, like? Hey, Marty, I'm going to be asking the questions here. Relax for a second. <laughs> um, what was that emotion like when your son decided uh, to go hockey instead of figure skating? Like, in a way, as somebody who doesn't have kids but is looking to hopefully have kids, I kind of hope that they take a different path, you know, so you can have a little bit of a different learning experience. Or maybe you know too much about the figure skating world or, or whatever. I'm kind of interested. Well, I got a couple of quick stories along those lines. I always determined that because of the – I know how my brother had to deal with – He was he's five years younger than I am, so he always had to deal with the David Santee shadow thing, and that was – he did a great job. That was tough. So I avowed that I would never put that pressure on my two sons to do anything that they didn't want to do. My older son, who is now a scientist, he lasted about one year in skating, and it was too frustrating for him. Michael did both skating and hockey because we wanted him to learn how to skate. And when he was 12, he came and he said, Dad, you know, I love to be in the ice show, but I really don't like figure skating that much. Can I just be a hockey player? And I said, you, you go ahead and be a hockey player. So, you know, I think that turned out pretty well for him. Yeah, wow. I'm kidding. David, David you brought up your brother a couple times, Jimmy, who – I've had the pleasure of uh, being at events with both of you. There seems to be a little bit of competition between uh, the two of you guys over the years. How much uh, have you given him over the years about you skating in two Olympics and maybe he was the front end or the back end of a horse in some show? No, that, that's uh, true. That's at the Broadmoor. Yeah. Well, and we know who the older brother is, so he was the back end for sure. But I will tell you this. My brother has beat me in one-on-one -on -one basketball one time in his life on a lucky bank shot. And the next game, I beat him 20 to nothing. So that's all you need to know. I can't picture your brother being on a basketball court. I've been watching a lot of TV at night, and it's the same movies over and over again because of the world we live in. And last night, it was Along Comes Polly, and Philip Seymour Hoffman was in that. And he was, make it rain, make it rain, and he's bouncing the ball. 90 miles an hour off the backboard. And that's kind of what I envision your brother uh, when he's close. on the basketball court. So. He has the grace of Charles Barkley when he plays basketball, <laughs> but he doesn't have the skill. Cool. And like, I'm kind of like Charles Dave, <laughs> <laughs> David, you're, you're now a judge. Um, and how does that compare to when you were competing? And have you ever had the chance to shaft Scott being a Canadian in any of the events that he was in? Did you ever take it to nationalistic and go personal and downgrade his scores just because well, you're an American? Fortunately for him, I, I'm on the tech panel and I, I do double duty. I'm a technical specialist for singles and then I do data and or video replay operator for everything. So the events that I've been on that he has competed in, I've always been either data or video. And I will say this, like, at that level, ice dancing is the most amazing and and just like frustrating sport because as a video operator, you have no idea sometimes when lifts will happen or when twizzles will happen or anything. All of a sudden, they're coming around the corner and they're up. And it's like, I missed it. So it, it can be very frustrating, but it's amazing. Like the great teams, the best teams, 
you know, like Tessa and Scott and Meryl and Charlie, they make it come out of nowhere. And it's uh, it's a, it's fantastic to watch when you're sitting in the data chair, but it's not as fantastic to watch. And I to this day, and this is an honest God truth. When I go to any worlds and I've been lucky enough to be assigned to all of them. When I go to worlds, Olympics, anything, I go to the dance practices because that's the one that I feel the least comfortable with. And so I want to be at the practices. I want to see their programs. I want to, again, get an idea of what's coming so that I'm not surprised. I, that's the one I still feel least comfortable with. So I, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, was, I was just chuckling at your story about you kicking your brother's butt in uh, basketball because I just mopped my brother's uh, my brother up in golf this morning. It doesn't get it old. I still feel like no, I'm doesn't. 12. But kicking his ass is still so satisfying. How many strokes did he give you, Scotty? Uh, he had none. And I played awful, but he played more awful. So that's great. You know? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Is your Was your score lower? Yeah. Yes. I, I had like win. five strokes on him, which is, a, yeah, it's great. I'm going to have to send him a text here and make sure he knows. But yeah. I don't remember being slighted too much by the Americans. That's for sure. No. Yeah, that's definitely not no. from them. I mean, in seriousness like that, we have pride in that, you know, we're there to do a job. And, yeah. uh, you know, it really, in, in, in all truth, it goes so fast. You know, I've had people say, well, you know, they, they don't like me, this and that. And it's like, it goes so fast. You have no idea to really worry about, you know, this and that. And somebody will ask me, like, even after an event, like, what did you think of blah, blah, blah? I'm like, I have no idea. I don't remember. Oh, yeah. It's gone. It's gone. You got to to do your job right, especially as a specialist. You got to move on. It's got to be a clean slate every time. So, yeah, you know, maybe when I was 30, I would have remembered more of the earlier skaters. But now it's now nah, it's gone. So you guys, remember, you remember me though. You well, remember. yeah, of course. It was the, you know, it was, it was all the uh, all the dollar bills you were throwing our way. So yeah, anybody remembers that. <laughs> all the two foot skating and hiding behind Tessa, it's hard to forget. Would that have been plastic money, or would that have been coins that they're having to throw since it's Canadian? And what, what's a, a two dollar coins worth about twenty seven cents U.S. You know, the plastic money works a lot better on the ice, eh? especially if, if, if we just had a flood because it, it doesn't get wet and rip. It's still just as durable. Well, that's why we had to go to that and can't always be on the ice. Uh-huh. Plus, if you ever dropped a $50 bill in the snowbank, you're pooched. This, the ours is just... <laughs> so, guys, got to ask a question. Growing up, who's your idol? Who's your skating idol? And have you met them? I have. I have. Uh, I had two major skating idols both americans john misha petkovich was a u.s champion in the 70s and he was the ultimate man's man when it came to skating he did the death drop i i i became really good at the death drop tick button thought i was the best in the world at it but that was completely as an honor to john misha petkovich i was inspired to learn that at a very young age and the other one you know and, and, and really a lot of it was just because of the way he carried himself was gary visconti was another uh, American male skater in the 60s mainly and he has been then and now the absolute epitome of class and um, I made sure you know when I was inducted in the U.S. Figure Skating Hall of Fame in 2015 he was in my speech because he was there and I said I just really want to um, let you know how much you meant to my career and how you know it's like you talk about being a, a mentor, and I know, Scott, I'm sure you take this seriously. I always have. I, I find that very important. You know, do the right thing and show a good example. And let's, you know, especially for guy skaters, like, you know, we had to take enough grief when we were growing up. So why not be a positive model and say, you know what, being a male skater is great. And it's a it's a way to meet girls. It's also a way to make it to nationals maybe a little easier. And, you know, it's certainly been awfully good to me. It's a lifetime of you know, joy and, you know, setting goals and, and achieving goals. And boy, I couldn't, I wouldn't change it for anything. Well, what the f- am I supposed to say now, David? You, think all the good <laughs> things you should go first. See, if I go first, then <laughs> no, no. all bets you are off. You deserve it. Uh, it's kind of similar. And it's, it's actually interesting that, I, you know, you kind of talked about what it was like being a young, young male skater. Cause um, you know, I was lucky like David and I played hockey and I played hockey with all my buddies. So I never really got ribbed, uh, but, being a figure skater and people are like, Oh, it must've been tough. But uh, my buddies also had to play hockey with me. So they were pretty cautious on teasing me about being a figure skater. Cause they knew that night we'd be on the ice and I'd be skating circles around them. Uh, but the other thing after, if someone outside of our circle would maybe tease me a little bit. And uh, if one of my friends didn't hear them after they kind of calmed down, they'd always be like, do you, uh, do you know Elvis Stoichel? 
because everyone <laughs> always wanted to know about Elvis in Canada and uh, you know about because he was just a different type of figure skater that you know Canadians had ever seen before and he brought such an intensity and uh, you know for an everyday hockey guy they just loved that about Elvis so you know when I first started skating that's really who I was into uh, who I followed and who I wanted to be just like I wanted to do uh, Return of the Dragon and uh you know, then it, it quickly changed to, to Dave Peltier because he was a, a really good friend of mine and a good role model, like you said. And coming in onto the scene young and going to our first Olympic Games, um, you know, as a favorite to win, we had to rely on role models like that. And I still do. And, and you know, you hear all about this, the cattiness of the sport of figure skating. And I was lucky to, to have great role models and, and people that I look up to. Um, you know, Scotty Hamilton, Brian Orser, and, and I still rely on, on all these people today to, to kind of guide me through this next phase. And uh, it's kind of cool. It's, there's, a, there's a really neat brotherhood. And I mean, it's not just a brotherhood, obviously, that, that extends to, to female role models as well. Um, but uh, it, it, it was kind of a cool ride that I was able to be on it and be able to rely on all those people, especially walking into your first Olympic Games without, you know, really having a clue on what to be there. And I think if I didn't have uh, Barb Underhill, uh, who works for the Toronto Maple Leafs, the best hockey team ever uh, in the history of the world, uh, but if she didn't tell me uh, about her experience in 88 when they wiped out going into their last spin, um, you know, I think there's a real chance that I would have blown it at the end. I am huge and I'm hugely emotional and she always talked about how she thought she let that slip through her hands because she lost focus before the program was over. And Kessa and I, through every Olympic, world, carnival skate, whatever, after she told us that story, we always had a saying to remember not to not to lose focus until we got in, into the uh, ticket to the kissing cry. And, you know, stuff like that was we were lucky to have that, to be able to share those stories, much like today with David. You know, it's kind of neat to be able to walk down memory lane, but there's also so much to learn. And that's a cool next chapter for me to be a role model for kids to look up. And yeah, we do take yeah. that very seriously. Like how, like to be able to, to be a positive, you, you hear so much negative things. There's so much negative things going on in the world today. I mean, look at all this stuff. And um, I can say, and, and hopefully Tessa can sit and say, well, there was a lot, um, especially being a young girl in the sport that Tessa had to go through that I didn't, but we had a positive sporting experience. We've worked with professionals who were professional and, taught us so much and we're very respectful and uh and sport brought a lot to my life and and hopefully i'll be able to kind of transfer that into a lot of other lives and it's just nice to know and for people to hear that that exists out there uh, that still does exist and that's why it's such an awful heinous crime when it, it's taken advantage of and we see those in the media and, and in the news every day but uh it yeah. also exists the other way where it can be so great great life experiences Scott. to share that, that, that's great to hear. W one thing, because I'm the dinosaur in the room, uh, and I know David's had the pleasure of meeting him, uh, there's a gentleman known as Mr. Debonair, who I think is one of the classiest individuals I've ever met in my life. Uh, always asked my dad, or asked about my dad when I would see him, and the only time he ever ran into my dad was when he was skating at the Met Center back in Bloomington, Minnesota, uh, with the ice capades and top hat and tails. Have you ever had the pleasure of meeting Richard Dwyer? No, I haven't actually. I don't oh. believe so. And I, if he, if he, a man, I'm the worst with names, so I will apologize to Richard if I have met him because there's a good chance, and I just, uh, I can't place him. But I would yeah. say if you had met him, you know it. I mean, he is he's an amazing guy. He remembers everybody's name, just like Doug said. Oh. It's, it's unbelievable. He's That's in his so cool. eight. He's in his eighties now, and um, he's still David. Maybe you can remember the the move because. I, the the twizzle came up, and I'm wondering if that's kind of like a Wally Wally, uh, as one of our <laughs> ISI board quite. members knows. That that's some of the only terms I think I know or have run across. So, um, but Richard Dwyer is uh, he used to skate in the ice capades, and at your young age, Scott, uh, you may not have had the pleasure, but you could probably find him on YouTube or stuff. And just he used to uh, skate okay. around the rink in top hat and tails, and he would give. Roses Mr. to Debonair. the ladies. Yeah, yep. just unbelievable guy. Just one of the nicest men I've ever run into uh, in the skating world. That's so cool. Absolutely. That's, I wish that that still existed when I got, like, the capades weren't a thing for us, really. I mean, but uh, there are some great skating shows out there still, so I won't go down that. Uh, but <laughs> so I got to well, ask. I get in that. 
Uh, I got to ask David something. David, you talked about the death drop, and and Scott, of course, we know Elvis's uh, his uh, back uh, backflip. Um, so we know that we have a visual of that. But I got to ask David, what is the death drop? It's you a know, flying uh, open reverse sit. So you basically the way that I have described it, especially when I skated, is you go full speed and backwards into this step forward and throw your body into the air with little regard for its safety and hope to land in a back sit position with both legs flying up and over. And you've done this? Yeah, many, many times. And I'm still here. Sorry, Blades of glory, spot, Scotty. You know, blades, blades, I, it's not quite blades of glory oh, and it is a cool. legal move and you'll see it you know to this day you'll still see it in competition but yeah Scotty, and the guys who do it well really do it well mm-hmm. guys and, and girls and, like it takes your breath away to see that have you done have you, it? i did I, I, I did it when i was young if when my marty when my blades leave the ice something seriously wrong has happened in a performance you know i'm <laughs> So I, I'm more of the base, you know, like I like to yes. be stable. That's kind of my thing. Patrick this year, Patrick Channing also has a, a pretty good death drop, but he had to teach me how to do a butterfly this year for the tour. And it was, yeah, oh, I just realized I just, I'm not a flyer. Thank God I didn't do singles. It wouldn't have worked so well. So the, I did a uh, show and I did a show in Salt Lake city and a, a Saturday afternoon show. And where the, the, at the one end of the stands, ironically, right where I did this big wind up into this death drop in the one program I was going to skate, was a handicapped wheelchair section. And it was like at the top of the dashboard. So they, it was, I was coming right to them. And they literally went to them and said, listen, this guy is going to come flying at you. Please do not have a heart attack. He knows what he's doing. So it's like there were no heart attacks uh, because of me. And I'm very happy to say that. <laughs> have you ever wiped out on that going into the oh yeah drop? i've gone oh, up yeah. in the air oh, missed my takeoff and you have about what feels like 10 minutes to ponder your next uh yeah which is going to be landing on your chest or you know yeah your wind's going to probably get knocked out or you know uh, other things may hit and that's even worse so yeah you can only imagine so yeah so that's that, bad when you miss your when you miss your takeoff that is bad <laughs> that is a great segue into my next question gentlemen skill sets that you both have and have worked on for years and you are who you are and what you've done and accomplished how much has ice conditions been a big role positively or negatively in the outcome of your performances hence you're talking to zamboni right now so we're kind of interested in understanding that if the if uh, you can share any experiences ice conditions well, I can tell you a quick story about uh, training with Marina Zueva. And, and at the time, we were very, very fortunate. Uh, she brought a lot of experience. At a, we trained with her in Canton, Michigan. And Charlie White and Merrill Davis and, and Tessa and I were all training with her. And I think she'd get a flood about once a day or twice a day, maybe. So we were skating on gravel. And, uh, you know, it's it, it was a good experience to be able to, like, really – make sure we can make it happen. I mean, it's different in ice dance. I don't think you could really do that uh, in singles and maybe not with the elements today in ice dance, but you kind of learned you had to make it happen uh, no matter what. But what I really miss and then going back and and hitting a fresh sheet of ice is that feeling of freedom. Like you can, on the ice, you can come pretty close to flying and that effortless glide, there's nothing like a clean sheet of ice. Um, You know, and if it's, if it's Zamboni ice, you can definitely feel a difference, Marty, if that was your, if that's what you're asking. No. Uh, but I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. But uh, it is clean. It is beautiful. And that effortless, quiet glide on fresh ice, um, it's, it's something different. And we're lucky enough in Canada to be able to skate outside every once in a while. But it's not quite the same. You really get spoiled and used to that ice being perfect. Uh, and nice. then you get addicted to it. Nice. Nice. How about you, David? Well, I never really had any experiences with outside of it when i was a professional and that was because we i was in the john curry company we tra- it was like a, a dance company on ice and we played the royal albert hall in london and they rented a i think <laughs> on the cheap uh refrigeration system which before the opening night pretty much turned the ice into slush and so because they didn't want to refund anybody their money, we still performed on slush. And I did my death drop, and the opposite happened. On the landing, my blade stuck, and I kept going, and my ankle just went. And so I finished the show. I took my skate off. My ankle went. So they took me to some hospital in London, but I think it was a MASH unit because, like, the X-ray machine I hadn't seen in, like, 40 years. 
<laughs> and um, and so it turns out I skated the rest of the tour. It never really felt better. And I used to go to the Chicago Bulls team doctor, which is kind of ironic because the last dance, which was just on here in the States about the Bulls, Dr. Heffron, who was my team doctor or my doctor as well, he was on the last couple episodes talking about, you know, the Bulls and all that. And uh, he used to always laugh because I would go in and he would say, OK, so you have this wrong. But did you know that you also did this? And that was one of those. So I went in for another ankle problem. And he looked at my x-rays and he goes, did you know you have a stress fracture in your, your right ankle? Did, how long has this bothered you? I'm like, I can tell you exactly when it happened. It happened in London a year and a half ago. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, it tells you what an idiot I am. For a year and a half, walked around a stress fracture, so. Or a okay. professional. Yeah, committed professional. Is that like the... That's, that's it, yeah. yeah. Never give up, never give up. Okay, guys, trivia time. You ready? Yep. Ooh, this is Zamboni know. trivia. This yep. is Zamboni trivia. So you might have played it in trivia pursuit. Not sure. Let's uh, let's uh, start with this. When Zambonis ice surfacers are manufactured before they actually conveyed snow, or when they conveyed snow into the uh, snow tank, how did they originally get the snow out of the snow tank? Well, I I don't know officially this answer, but I'm going to make a guess that it was just by shovel. Well, true? Th see, th that's an unfair question for the youngin that we've got on this program here, Marty. <laughs> Only us old folks know that and, and have probably seen a paddle and chain machine. Yeah, and that, that uh, like I said, that, that was kind of an educated guess. I mean, it just makes sense that before. Uh, and I know, like, when I first started skating at the old Michael Kirby studio rink in, you know, way back in. The Cabana Club? Yeah, almost. Uh, this was in this was in, also in Park Ridge, my hometown. But uh, they okay. had this little like it was probably like a John Deere or something that they put a little thing in the back, and then my dad would use the shovel and get the snow out. So that was my only reason for guessing that. And I yeah. mean, up on top of that, I'm just extremely smart. On top, yeah. So let's well, let's just call it how it is. Your your first game with the Blackhawks or at the Blackhawks at the old stadium, which. I have some disdain for the team, just like I do for the Red Wings, even though I respect both the organizations immensely. Some of my best friends are with the Hawks. What was your first game there at the uh, old stadium? So that I, I don't think you're quite old enough to have seen when they would have been using um, one of the original machines. No, but, uh, you know, with the, the stuff going on the top and all that, yeah. Uh, when I when I skated the old wagon wheel, they had one of those. So that's that uh, I did that. But the, my first experience at the old Chicago Stadium, and again, it's why I was infatuated with Bobby Hull. I, my dad took me. We were in the second balcony above the Blackhawks goal, and Bobby Hull it was against. Get this, the California Golden Seals. So <laughs> that's green a good and yellow one. skates. So, <laughs> so he's he's streaking down the left wing he gets to the blue line he lets go this cannon the goalie never moved and there was no interference there was no nothing it was on the rush right and i'm like wow that's my guy so that's that was my first introduction to the blackhawks to the old chicago stadium to bobby hull it was and it was i used to get in trouble because you know we'd get up and skate at 5 45 in the morning and i would have this old radio and I couldn't get the volume of that radio to go low enough so I could get away with watch, listening to the Blackhawks games at night because I'd have it to like as low as you could. And my dad would somehow come in and say, you got to turn that off. <laughs> what do you mean? I don't know what you're talking about. You got to turn that off. And so then I would try to get it any lower if I could and just so I could hear it. But I don't know how he did it. He had this am amazing like there must have been some sort of like booby trap in there or something that he knew that I was uh, uh, <laughs> that I was. Uh, illegally listening to games when I should be sleeping, getting ready for the next day skating. Scott, you didn't get to answer the question. We kind of lost you there for a moment. Um, yeah, you have you ever I'm seen? Intimidated. I'm intimidated by this, uh, a little bit of a competition here, but who it are the a... California Golden Seals? That's oh. what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Char Charlie O. Finley, the owner of the Oakland A's, was the original owner. They're part of the second uh, six. And uh, oh, they became the cool. Cleveland Barons, who then became the part of the Minnesota oh. North Stars, if my memory serves me right. Yeah, it was That's the impressive. Oakland Seals, and then I think it was the California Golden Seals, and then yeah. they went on their way. Yeah. Wow. 
I thought I knew and everything about hockey, but you guys get well, one up. Did you, know there's, did you know there's an NHL team in Colorado before the Avalanche there, Scotty? Yeah, the Rockies. Yeah, that I knew. Okay, but, okay. And where, where did know, they go to? The Jersey Devils. Exactly. Uh, and who were they before here. they became the Rockies? Uh, not Kansas City. Yes, Kansas City Scouts. Yeah, it was Kansas City. Woo! <laughs> yeah, bring Not those bad. trivia questions on. I'm on <laughs> fire. Know, by the way, I earned I already earned it. five thousand uh, dollars while you were off. So <laughs> that's it. That, that's it. That's like who wants to be a millionaire? Right? Yeah. I'm ready. Exactly. Oh, here, we, here, here we go. Here's the next one. Ready? Yep. Ready. Why doesn't Why doesn't a zamboni actually slide on the ice? Studs. Stud tires. Yeah, studs. Uh -oh. That's a okay, tie. Get, yeah, that was an easy. They, they each get a oh, point. You didn't see my buzzer? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> next one. How many Zambonis have actually been manufactured to date? And I'll give it within, I'll go within 250 machines. No, I, I think There's I know. I, well, I know the answer. You do? Because I, I Google it. It's 12,000. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Scotty? I told you I'm competitive. Well, I, was, I, I wouldn't I have known that. Like enough. That's the only one that I I would have been I up, I would have been up around 25,000. Well, if, oh, well, if there was a better sales force, then we probably would be. But between Marty and I, we're only so good, you know. We have, so we have actually, to look Scott, at the video. Scott's right because he got what it should be the number. <laughs> and I was also yeah. right because I got the number based on YouTube. I'm just projecting future sales here. There we go. Yeah. Thanks, Scotty. <laughs> it's going to be a big year next year. Yeah. It's a good year. <laughs> yeah. Endorsements coming your way. There you go. Hey, how many water tanks in a Zamboni? Two. I drove the Zamboni. I know that. See, I get confused because I think of the propane, but that's not. Uh, that's not water, Scott. That's, that's not gas. water, right? Hold okay. On. I haven't got my gas <laughs> ticket yet, but propane isn't water. I got my that much. This is not going to be my yeah. strength. It's definitely two, David, or should I yes, guess? Yes, it's like two. It's, it's two. Right? Yeah, that one I know. Okay. Flood, flood water and wash oh, water. Oh, yeah. Just the we eliminated oh, the bonus point sorry. there. Well, well, I got that one with the water. The two water. I've, I've had to go. clean that out, so I know the flood water is one of them. I usually am oh. just talking and shooting the shit with the arena guy as he's doing all the maintenance, so I should maybe pay more attention. And that's there why it go. takes him 15 minutes to do arena. a flood, Scott. Listen to me, eh? Arena person. Like, I grow up, it's 2020 or something. Zamboni <laughs> operator, to be politically correct. There you go. I want to get into the fire round here where it's going to be rapid okay. questions. And this oh, is going to be weird. this is going to be somewhat food related because of my round nature. I, I'm about five months pregnant. I was in a competition with my stepdaughters, and unfortunately, they gave birth, and I didn't. So now <laughs> their kids are anywhere from two to uh, we've got a grandson that's 21 years old. So um, I'm just going along here and would like to get rid of this, but I know it's not going to happen. So um, both you guys. And this is going to be somewhat directed towards Chicago. But, Scott, I want to get your opinion because you've traveled around quite a bit. Um, what's the best beef location that either one of you had? And I'm talking about Italian beef, not steaks. Beef? Yep. Um, what's that? I don't know. Like, whoa. Okay, we're uh, gonna yeah, to, that, you're, you're talking gotta, Chicago, Chicago on that. Yeah. Chicago there you go. There you go. Gotta, you're talking yeah, Chicago on that, on that question. That's Portillo's for me. Yeah, not yeah, Johnny. Portillo's is the best. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty good. Okay. I, I mean, Scott, if you would have thrown the... in a really greasy cheeseburger, you could have gone with Paradise Pup. White Castle. Paradise no. Pup is excellent. White, but White, White Castle. <laughs> White Castle is the no, a hangover no. prevention. No, it's bad. No, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. No wonder you're an Anaheim Ducks fan because obviously you settle for way less than the best. Ooh. It's only when you've been drinking. Only when you've been drinking, bud. Okay, best hot dog. There is not enough beer in the world to get me to drink enough to have White Castle. I'm sorry. That's uh, true. I guess, Marty, we'd have the Montreal smoked meat, but I don't. It's not quite like Chicago, man. Uh, God, no. Next time you come to Chicago. What a city. Italian beef. Yeah, it, next time you come to Chicago. It is the best. It is the best. Especially when you uh, when you head over to, uh, what's that, Dooley Piano place in Chicago there? Uh, oh, yeah, I've uh, been to that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, so have I. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's the uh, over the moon or something. The moon, oh, yeah. howling moon. The howling, howling moon. moon. Howling moon. Howl at, yeah. moon. Howl at the moon saloon. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Best hot I'm dog. Yeah. 
So you're not a hot dog fan. I am, yeah. I, like, you know what? Did you see that stat about how many hot dogs are not being eaten because there's no MLB this year? Yeah, it's supposed to be something outrageous. It's true. Like, they're just, like, they have way too many hot dogs. They don't know what to do. But I, a lot I, of pigs aren't going to die. Hot dog fan, but being at the park, and that's something I fell in love with in Detroit. And I know that's hard for someone from Chicago to hear, but, um, you know, I, I wasn't a baseball fan at all. And still, I kind of, started living in America and living in Detroit and going to Comerica a couple times a week. And then I just fell in love with it. And there's something about sitting in the park and, uh, and I'm people in Canada are gonna be pissed off to hear that I'm a Tigers fan instead of a Jays fan, but it's the park, man. We had some good teams during those years. I was down there and sitting in the park on a nice day. And I mean, back then looking at a band of buildings, eating a hot dog, it was a great time. Well, I, it, ironically, uh, my brother and I and my son, we take a baseball trip in August every year. Obviously not this year, but every year. And two years ago, we went to Comerica. We went to the Pittsburgh Park and we went to Cleveland. And I agree, Comerica is a great park. You know, it's I love cool, the right? I love the tribute to the guys in right field. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, the food is good. I have to say, though, best hot dog for me, Dodger Dogs. Really? They're good. They're yeah. Far- yeah. Farmer John, they you good. can get those nationally. Bacon wrapped <laughs> is good. You know, anything I'm with bacon is better. <laughs> Oh, that's why I'm fat, you know. <laughs> Pittsburgh and Cleveland, good parks too, though. It so, is, yeah, but of the good. three, of the three, that was third place for me. Yeah. And then well, the following year, last year, in fact, Doug and I went to a game in Washington during our conference. Yeah. But, uh, we went back. I went back the same year and saw Washington, Philadelphia, and the Orioles, and I loved Camden Yards. Of oh, the six, love- my favorite. That was an incredible really? place. And our hotel was right next to the park, so, I mean, you they didn't have to them. take a car or anything. It was awesome. Like that was a lot of fun, and it, it because it was two terrible teams, the Royals and the Orioles. It was a really good game because they both were terrible. They both had bad pitching, so that means there were a lot of hitting. You know, there was some bad fielding because they're terrible, and so there was just stuff going on the whole time. And they got a great souvenir store. Who Powell's right next door to the or attached? Uh, to the we building. went there. Well, of course, my brother was with me, so of course we went to Boot Powell's. Yeah. Okay, Doug, ask your last question because it's a good one. I want to see their well, answer. No, there. Well, there's one, and then I've got one that's just going to be a David. He'll he'll get it, and it's gonna it's an inside one that he can think about. Okay. Best pizza. That's there's Chicago, a lot of man. argument. There's care. a lot of argument in Chicago. You know, <laughs> uh, let's go for deep dish, which of course is a, a Chicago tradition. Um, there is big big arguments between Giordano's and Lou Malnati's. Malnati's. There is a very passionate Lou Malnati side, and there's a very passionate Giordano side. So I'll tell you this, being the diplomatic guy that I am, when I want a cheese deep dish pizza, I go Giordano's. When I want yeah. a pepperoni or sausage, I go Malnati's. So it just depends on what you want. So, And then you know, thin pizza, you can find good thin pizza. Although our favorite place, a place called Riggio's, closed. The owners, oh. after 60 years, decided to retire. Like, what's with that? And so, How yeah, so they? that one's gone. So, Scotty, yeah, but that's not, those aren't pizzas. Those are lasagnas there. In exactly. That's unbelievable. Exactly. Like, <laughs> over a couple pieces of pizza, and you're like, that's big. They're pretty damn good, though. I'll say that. You're making me miss your city here. Okay. One last question, David. And okay. Scott, you're, you're, you're welcome to answer this as well. The question is, yes, no, or abstain? <laughs> abstain. <laughs> I got to hear that. What's the back? What's the Doug is famous that? in ISI board meetings. No matter what the vote is, he abstains. <laughs> I, I don't like to take a position because I don't like to offer up an opinion very often. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> he loves to offer up the opinion, and when it comes time to put a vote behind his opinion, nah, abstain. No, I think I got to check my watch. I, yeah, I got to do something with some guy. Yeah, I got 12,000 Zambonis I got to sell to make Scott's quota. Yeah, I just got, I, I can't vote. So, Scott, you know, us Canadians, we're, us Canadians are so, we're just so grateful and we're, and we're just nice people all the time. We're always saying thank you. So the Skate Canada thing wouldn't match ISI, so don't worry about it. It's all good, buddy. <laughs> it's all good. It's all no good. Kidding, eh? Yeah. So uh, uh, let me let me take you to this uh, last question before uh, we bring it to uh, bring it to an end. Uh, a lot of things going on. Uh, you both uh, spoke about uh, that we're dealing with right now. Uh, COVID-19. I know you're both 
part of your uh, your uh, um, your uh, skate uh, Canada for Scott ISI uh, uh, for uh, David. Um, share a little bit about uh, uh, both, and I know Skate Canada they've uh, come back. David, I believe uh, uh, your organization has come back. What your involvement was in in uh, putting together best practices, uh, the SOP. Uh, for what's going on uh, for figure skaters uh, in, uh, in arenas. Uh, maybe you can share, uh, Scott, what's what's happening in uh, Skate Canada. Well, it is. A, it's, what a crazy time. And if this thing, uh, this pandemic really puts figure skating and being on the ice into perspective, for sure. So, yeah. um, you know, at, at, first of all, like we, our goal is, is always to make sure that we're in a safe environment. And we have to make sure that we respect the... You know, this is this is exactly that a global pandemic. It's very serious, and, and people are dying from it. And it's it's sad. It's sad that the world's in in this condition, and it's it's tough. But um, the other part of it too is is trying to figure out how you know we can kind of live with it and still be productive. And in our area of the world, um, we have limited cases, and we feel like we can get on the ice with social distancing. And and I will say, uh, I think that Ski Canada has been very proactive in, in trying to give us that opportunity as long as it's safe to do so. So, you know, it's kind of been a, it's a bit of a runaround. Uh, everyone's trying to figure out what direction um, this disease is going to go and then now it's going to, how it's going to affect the world. And, and then that also try and offer young people an opportunity to get out and do things that are quote unquote normal. And uh, skating is, is, is that outlet for a lot of our athletes. So. We kind of like I was impressed uh, with with Skate Canada and bringing out a, a return to play protocol that that was safe and easy. I mean, I'm an ice dancer, so uh, my students they're skating, but they're not touching right now. Um, and then they come in with masks and, and kind of the first day or two, it's a little bit like military camp. They come in, they stay separate, they march to the ice differently. But um, after everyone kind of got used to it, it feels very safe uh, and everyone seems to be respectful and, and also the kids are just happy to be able to get back and, and see their friends from afar. I mean, from two meters, but uh, to be together again in any aspect for them is, has been a huge plus. So um, we're going to kind of continue on. We're hoping that if we do it safely and well, uh, that, that we'll be able to still have the numbers curving the right way in, in our area and, and react and respond appropriately after that. So we kind of give them a little bit of a tip of the cap of just Gate Canada. I mean, for being so organized and being on top of that and allowing us to be able to get it on the ice. Yeah, due diligence. That's a great story. How about yourself, David? Well, both ISI and U.S. Figure Skating have, you know, put out, not suggestions, but kind of, you know, there's the one nice thing is, you know, with social media and with, you know, contacts, there's been a lot of, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, so you get that, you'll get a lot of that. Uh, because I work for a park district, uh, park district wide, you know, all our facilities, they came out with this is the way we're going to do stuff. We are in the 10 skaters max on the ice. Uh, we change, we call them group areas. So we'll have a changing area one, a changing area two, and we keep going back and forth. And then our, our maintenance guy will disinfect uh, the area that's been cleared. Uh, I am the only person taking attendance. All the registration is online, so we're not taking any money live. It's all pre-bought, uh, and I'm teaching almost all the competitive skating classes, which, again, 10 is our max. Ryan Bradley is uh, here at my rink, and so he helps me out with the overflow. But, you know, we're trying to – obviously, the Park District is trying to get back on its feet with all their programming, so they had to really be careful as to the amount of people they brought back and – you know, so we're all pitching in and right. I mean, the kids just loved being back. You know, we've been back two weeks now. And that day one, first of all, after not coaching for two plus months, I just, it rekindled my love for why I do what I do and why I wanted to be a coach. And then just to see the joy in the kids' face and how happy they were they see their friends and see me. You know, that's, that's really what makes it worthwhile. I thought it was, that's a great point too, David, but I felt exactly the same way. And it's cool to hear someone who's, uh, you know, had the history that you've had and, and been so successful, still finding the love for the sport. And, mm -hmm. you know, for all these young skaters who have specialized in one particular sport and a little bit maybe could be a problem. I know in Canada, like everyone who plays hockey is going to be the next Sidney Crosby and everyone who skates is going to be the next Patrick Chan. Some ways I kind of think, okay, you know what? Nine weeks off. I know the world's in a bit of a mess, but it's okay for these kids to be back from skating. I've noticed a big boost 
uh, in my athletes, how they're excited and they see skating as a privilege, not something that they have to do. And it can be a grind for young athletes at that age. So there is some positives to take. And then as a coach, I felt the same way, Dave. That's, that's a great thought. Great thought. Yeah, I mean, he, he said that really well. It's it's uh, to see the joy in their faces, and and in a lot of cases, some of our skaters, after not being on the ice skating for two and a half months, they came back better than when they left, which I thought was fascinating. You know, because they're just like I said, they're just out there for the joy of the sport. They're they're loving what they're doing. So as a result, instead of tightening up and being worried, am I going to miss this or am I going to make it? They are. You know, and, and the hard part as a coach, and I'm sure Scott can verify this is. We can't even direct them as to, okay, this is your first competition coming up because we have no idea. You know, in, in Illinois, we're only at phase three, so we can only have groups of 10 or less, and we don't know when phase four is going to hit. So we can't say, well, we're going to have a competition in July. We're going to have another one in August. All we keep hearing is Skate Milwaukee is canceled, Broadmoor Open is canceled, you know, another competition is canceled, Lake Placid was canceled. And so we haven't heard yet one say, you know, we're going to be able to give it a go. You know, outside of a couple clever people like Gail Tanger, they're going to do the Peggy Fleming trophy mm -hmm. virtually. So, but oh, that's, smart. yeah, that's a, but it's a limited event, you know, for 18, uh, you know, of the top skaters and they can, they can record a program. I think it's, it's live. I think it's going to be like zoom. They're going to have it live, but they're going to be at their own practice arena. And then the officials will be at their house and yeah, it should be interesting. Guys, I got to say thank you. Thank you on behalf of Zamboni. This has been a pleasure for the last hour and 20 minutes. Uh, Doug, anything you want to add or ask? No, it, it was a pleasure to meet you, Scott. David, as always, I enjoy spending time with you. Uh, it was nice to learn a little bit more uh, about your skating history. I, I mean, I know you, but I don't know everything. And I've enjoyed reading Wikipedias on both you guys. And Scott, I hope that someday that I'll get the opportunity to meet you in person. And Marty, I want to thank you for doing a bang up job on this. It's awesome. Thank you very much for yeah. including me. Yeah, Top thanks. shelf, Marty. Thanks, Top shelf. Yeah, yeah thanks, that was David. fun. Thanks, nice to meet you, yeah. everybody. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. David, uh, and you know what? Yourself, brother. Yeah, hopefully yeah. we see each other down the road. If you come to Chicago, Italian beef's on me. You're on. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, listen, greatly appreciate it. Thanks, our, thank you uh, to our guests, David uh, Santee and Scott Moyer for joining us on Ask the Zamboni Experts, and we look forward to you joining us for our future segment coming up next.